Uh, we are going to uh, Finance Minister Krista Freeland right now. Statement tabled in Parliament on November 3rd, 2022, and certain provisions of the budget tabled in Parliament on April 7th, 2022. Pursuant to Standing Order 83-2, I would ask that an order of the day be designated for the consideration of this motion. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. For the past several months, I have been traveling across Canada to more than two dozen cities and towns to meet with Canadian workers and Canadian businesses. I visited an auto parts manufacturer in Etobicoke, a potash mine outside Saskatoon and the women and men in Sherbrooke who make the boots are armed forces wear around the world. I visited the port of St. John in New Brunswick and a family farm in Olds, Alberta, and in Dartmouth and in Brampton and in Calgary. I spent time with some of the truckers who keep our economy humming. The Canadians I spoke to were all so proud of our country. They were proud of the hard work they do every day to feed Canada and the world, to build our cars, to send our goods to global markets, to raise their children. But they were also anxious, anxious about whether our future will be as prosperous as our past and anxious about paying the bills today. And that's where I want to start, with the high cost of living so many of us, so many Canadians, are concerned about. I know that it has felt like just one thing after another since COVID first reached our shores. We turned the economy off, and then we turned it back on again. Vladimir Putin illegally invaded Ukraine. And now we're dealing with inflation. These are related, of course. Global inflation isn't created by the decisions of any one government alone, but by the combined aftershocks of two and a half years of historic turmoil. Inflation was 6.9% in September after following for the third month in a row. That is lower than in the US, the UK, and the Eurozone. But for Canadians feeling the pinch at the checkout counter or when they fill their tanks with gas, it is still too high. This is a challenging time for so many of us, for our friends, for our families, for our neighbors. And it's important, as both the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance, that I'm honest with Canadians about the challenges that still lie ahead. Interest rates are rising as the Bank of Canada steps in to tackle inflation. And that means our economy is slowing down. It means there are people whose mortgage payments are rising. It means business is no longer booming in the same way it has been since we left our homes after the COVID lockdowns and went back out into the world. That's the case in Canada. That's the case in the United States. And that is the case in economies big and small around the world. Canada cannot avoid the global slowdown any more than we could have avoided COVID once it had begun infecting the world. But we will be ready. Indeed, we are ready. That's because for the past seven years, our government has been reinforcing Canada's social safety net. We have improved many important programs and added some new ones too. Susan, this
these investments in Canadians are like a well-built house with a solid roof needed in all seasons and in all weather, but most essential when the temperature drops. And that is why, as fall turns to winter, we will continue to stand up to those who would cut the EI and the pensions Canadians have been contributing to for their entire working lives and need today more than ever. It's why we created the Canada Child Benefit and why we are making child care more affordable. It's why we enhanced the benefits that those who served with our flag on their shoulder depend on. It's why we doubled the Canada Student Grant to make it a little easier for all young people to go to college or university or to pursue an apprenticeship. It's why we enhanced the Canada Workers' Benefit and why we increased both old age security and the guaranteed income supplement. That is why it is so important that the Canada Pension Plan and our most important benefits are all indexed to inflation. And in today's fall economic statement, that is why we're delivering on a plan that millions of Canadians voted for just over a year ago, and why we're delivering new measures to enhance the social safety net that is there to support all Canadians. We're working to deliver lower credit card fees so that small businesses don't need to choose. So that small businesses don't need to choose between cutting into their already narrow margins and passing fees onto their customers. We're taxing share buybacks to make sure that large corporations pay their fair share and to encourage them to reinvest their profits in Canadian workers and in Canada. We're delivering a multi-generational home renovation tax credit, which will help families across Canada afford to have a grandparent or a family member with a disability move back in if they want to. We're tackling housing speculation and making sure that homes are for Canadians to live in, not a frequently flipped investment asset. We're delivering on our commitment to make home ownership more affordable for young people and new Canadians with a new tax-free first home savings account that will make it so much easier to save for a down payment. And we're delivering with a doubling of the first-time home buyer's tax credit to help cover the closing costs that come with buying that first home of your own. are permanently eliminating interest on the federal portion of Canada student loans and Canada appraisals. We're working to make sure that families don't need to choose between taking their child to the dentist and putting food on the table. We're creating a new quarterly Canada Workers' Benefit to deliver advance payments and put more money sooner into the pockets of our lowest paid and often most essential workers. This means the Canada Workers' Benefit will now support 4.2 million Canadians. We're providing hundreds of dollars in new targeted support to low-income renters. For the Canadians who need it the most, 
we are doubling the GST credit for the next six months. And I have some very good news about that. For the 11 million Canadian households who need help the most, those GST checks will start arriving in your bank account or in your mailbox tomorrow. And for the Canadians who need it the most, we are doubling the GST credit for the next six months. And I have some very good news. For the 11 million Canadians who need help the most, those GST checks will start arriving in your bank accounts and in your mailbox starting tomorrow. We are providing targeted inflation relief because that is the right thing to do. And as the Bank of Canada fights inflation, we will not make its job harder. We are compassionate and we are also responsible. Canada has the lowest deficit and Canada has the lowest deficit and the lowest debt to GDP ratio in the G7. It in our April budget, with inflation in Canada and around the world elevated and still rising, we knew we had to chart a fiscally responsible course, and we did. In April, we committed to bringing the deficit down to just 2% of GDP this year. Today, we forecast it will be just 1.3% of our $2.8 trillion economy. We can bring the deficit down today because our pandemic spending worked. Thanks to the historic support we provided and thanks to the incredible resilience of Canadians, Canada is entering this time of a slowing global economy from a position of fundamental economic strength. There are 400,000 more Canadians working today than before the pandemic. Our economy is now 103 percent the size it was before COVID hit. So far this year, Canada's economic growth has been the strongest in the G7, stronger than the United States, stronger than the United Kingdom, stronger than Germany, stronger than France, stronger than Italy or Japan. Thanks to that enviable economic performance, we're able to provide targeted support to the most vulnerable while still shrinking our deficit. In the months to come, we will be able to invest in the Canadian economy and to be there for the Canadians who need it the most because we were responsible in April and because we are keeping our powder dry today. Canadians are tough and the Canadian economy is resilient. And that's why we can all be confident we will get through this just as we have gotten through so much over the past two and a half years. In fact, there is no country in the world better placed than Canada to get through. There is no country better placed than Canada to get through the coming global slowdown. And when we do, with our fundamental economic strengths preserved and the pandemic recession behind us, there is no country in the world better placed than Canada to thrive in a post-COVID 
global economy. We grow food to feed the world. And we mine the potash that farmers here and elsewhere need to grow their own. We have the critical minerals and metals that are essential for everything, from cell phones to batteries to appliances to electric cars. We have the natural resources to power the global net zero transition and to support our allies with their energy security as that transition continues to pick up speed. And critically, Canada is the democracy that has all of these resources in abundance. The The global economy is at a turning point. We're entering an era of friendshoring, a time when our democratic partners and their most important companies are seeking to shift their dependence from dictatorships to democracies. That's why the Prime Minister and Chancellor Schultz signed an agreement in Newfoundland for Germany to buy Canadian hydrogen. That's why the United States has moved from a Buy America to a Buy North America policy on critical minerals and electric vehicles. C'est pourquoi. That is why our Minister of Industry has been signing agreements with global car manufacturers and battery makers. A new one almost every day, it seems to me. That is why our Minister of Natural Resources is pitching Canada's critical minerals to the world and working hard with provinces and territories to get them out of the ground and to global markets. Because the world knows Canada can build the electric vehicles of today and tomorrow. Canadians can mine and process the critical v minerals that those vehicles, our phones and our computers, are all made of. And Canadian energy workers, the very best in the world, can make Canada the leading provider of energy as the global economy moves to net zero. Our allies are counting on us. And our government believes that this ongoing shift is the most significant opportunity for Canadian workers and Canadian businesses in a generation. Les investissements. Seizing this opportunity is what our April budget invested in. And it is what this fall economic statement invests in too with major investment tax credits for clean technology and clean hydrogen, we will make it more attractive for businesses to invest in Canada to produce the energy that will power a net zero global economy. We are launching a new Canada Growth Fund that will help attract the billions of dollars in new private capital required to fight climate change and to create good jobs in Canada at the same time. That is the finance minister delivering the fall economic statement. We've been all watching it live together from Ottawa. The fall economic statement projects the federal deficit at $36.4 billion in 22-23. That's down from the $52.8 billion forecast in April. Of course, the uh, federal pocketbook benefiting from inflation. Inflation that is fortunately cutting into our pocketbooks a lot, much, uh, quite a lot at this time that the uh, government delivers its budget. The fiscal picture also projects that the federal coffers could be back in the black by 2027-2028.